What's up, everyone? Lily here. Today we are going to talk about some very common mistake students make in IELTS writing test one. As you may or may not know, a key factor in scoring high in the grammar part is not to write super long, complicated sentences, but to constantly produce error-free sentences. As you can see in my score explainer, one of the reasons why I was able to score a seven in the writing test is that many of my sentences were correct. I made only a few mistakes with grammar and the punctuation. So the goal of this video is to help you avoid mistakes so that you can write error-free sentences and score higher in grammar. First of all, let's talk about the verb fluctuate. Many people use it when there is only little change. This is incorrect because to fluctuate means to change continually or irregularly. For example, for these two lines, we can use fluctuate and say that overall, the number of shops that closed and the number that opened both saw large fluctuations. We can use the fluctuations here because the numbers change continually and irregularly. However, we shouldn't use fluctuates to describe these three categories in this chart. Take this category for example. Don't say that the percentage of people who ate in fast food restaurants several times a week fluctuated during the 10-year period. First of all, there are only three data points. To fluctuate means to change continually. Therefore, you would require more than three data points to use it. Apart from that, the number didn't change irregularly. So, what verb should we use to describe this category? Well, we can use range or vary. We could say that the proportion of those eating in fast food restaurants several times a week ranged or varied between 15 and 20 percent. Let me give you another example. This graph shows goods transported in the UK. Sun Elts Guru teaches students to write the overview like this. Overall, wire shipments by road, water, and pipeline increased during the 28-year period. Rail shipments fluctuated. Yes, rail shipments fluctuated. But if they say rail shipments fluctuated, I can argue that road and water shipments also fluctuated. So I don't think it's a good idea to use fluctuate to describe rail. I think it would be much better to say that rail shipments were essentially unchanged. There were fluctuations, but in essence, they didn't change. Shipments increased for all modes except rail, which stayed essentially unchanged. Here's another example to help you understand the use of essentially unchanged. This graph shows the proportion of the population aged 65 and over with projections. This graph is from Cambridge Out 5, which was published in 2006. So let's assume that the projections start right after 2006. In the overview, don't say that the proportion of over 65s in Japan has been fluctuating because fluctuate means to change irregularly. But as you can see, the percentage shows only small changes. We shouldn't say that the proportion has remained unchanged either, because there were some small changes. Don't worry, we can use essentially unchanged. Overall, the proportion of over 65s in Japan has remained essentially unchanged. Now, what about this line of fish consumption? Fish consumption neither fluctuated nor remained unchanged. What verb can we use? The right verb to use here is hover. To hover means to stay at or near a particular level. You use it when there are only small changes. Although less fish was consumed than any of the other meats throughout the period, its consumption level was fairly stable, hovering around the 50 grams mark the entire time. Hover is a very good word choice here. I first said fairly stable. Which implies some slight fluctuations. Hover suitably describes its gently move up and down, but around a fixed position, which is the 50 grams mark. In short, we use hover when there is only little change, but use fluctuate when the number varies irregularly. So when fluctuate doesn't work, try range, vary, hover, or essentially unchanged. 
Now let's move on to the second common mistake, which is not being aware that you are actually doing a percentage increase calculation. Let's look at these charts. They gave information on the ages of the populations of Yemen and Italy. When describing the increase from 46.3 to 57.3 percent, many people say that the proportion of those aged 15 to 59 is expected to increase by 11 percent. 11 percent is incorrect because as long as you express this number as a percentage, then you are actually calculating a percentage increase, not an absolute increase. If we use a percentage increase calculator to calculate, we will find that the proportion actually increases by roughly 24 percent, not 11 percent. But of course, we don't have time to do such complex calculations in an actual exam. We only want to do simple calculations. In this case, the measurement we need is percentage points, not percent. The proportion of those aged 15 to 59 is expected to increase by 11 percentage points to 57.3 percent. You need to be very careful when the numbers are expressed as percentages. I mean, if the numbers are not shown as percentages, we can do a simple calculation and say, for example, electricity production from coal increased by 80 units to 130 units. However, as long as you express a number as a percentage, then you are actually calculating a percentage increase, which is something we don't want because it's time-consuming. Remember the measurement percentage points. The percentage is expected to increase by 11 percentage points. Next up, let's talk about the prepositions among and of. Many people use among where of should be used. Let's look at this table. It gives information about the underground railway systems in six cities. When describing London, we could say that London's is the oldest of the systems in the six cities, not among. Of is the preposition we should use when comparing one member of a group to the rest. For example, she's the eldest of three sisters. She's a member of a group formed by three sisters. And I'm comparing her to the rest of the group, so of should be used. In this sentence, London's is short for London's system. I'm comparing London's system to the systems in the other cities. London's system is a member of a group formed by six systems, and being part of a group always uses of or out of. Yes, out of also works, but don't use among. Here's another example. This graph shows the percentage of households with electrical appliances. When reporting washing machines figure in 1920, we could say that washing machines were the most common of the three electrical appliances in 1920, with ownership reaching 40% of households. Here, we should use of, not among. Try to interpret it this way. Washing machines were the most common appliance of the three electrical appliances. Washing machines are a member of a group formed by three electrical appliances. You can't say member among. Being part of a group always uses of or out of. Now I'm going to show you a very useful expression you can use to make comparisons. When you want to point out the highest percentage in a year, you can always say that the percentage is the highest percentage of something. Let's still use the washing machines figure in 1920 as an example. We could say that 40% of households owned a washing machine in 1920, the highest percentage of the three electrical appliances that year. Of is the best preposition to use here. You could use among, but of is simpler and more usual. You may think, oh, this is wrong. You are comparing a percentage to electrical appliances. You could interpret this part this way: forty percent is the highest percentage of the three percentage figures for ownership of electrical appliances. But of course, no one would say this. It's wordy. We simply say the highest percentage of the three electrical appliances. 
I'm explaining this to you because I don't want to leave the impression that I'm comparing a percentage to appliances. As you can see, what is being compared here are the three percentages. We are comparing the percentage of households owning a washing machine to the percentages of households owning the other two appliances. 40% is a member of a group formed by three percentages, and being part of a group always uses of. Now, let me use another example to show you how useful this expression can be. For this Lie graph, we can make a comparison here at the end of the period. We can say that this percentage is the highest percentage of the three countries. The proportion of over 65s in Japan is predicted to double to 10% by 2030 before soaring to 27% by 2040, the highest percentage of the three countries that year. Again, I'm not comparing a percentage to countries, I'm comparing three percentages. Try to interpret it this way. 27% is the highest percentage of the three percentage figures for over 65s. 27% is a member of a group formed by three percentages, and when we compare one member of a group to the rest, we should use of. Hopefully, I haven't confused you, and now you know when to use of and not among. Next up, let's talk about the definite article. Do you know that often you don't need to use it with an uncountable noun? Let's look at this graph again. When describing refrigerator, we can say that almost no households had a refrigerator in 1920. However, ownership, not the ownership, increased rapidly. And by 1980, there was one in every household. Ownership is uncountable, so it's grammatically correct to just say ownership. The definite article is unnecessary, and the meaning is also clear. In context, it will be interpreted as meaning refrigerator ownership. What else could it mean? So just say ownership, not the ownership. Here's another example. This graph shows fish and meat consumption. When describing beef consumption, we can say that despite a handful of large fluctuations, beef remained the most commonly consumed meat before 1989, averaging 180 to 240 grams per person per week. Consumption, not deconsumption, then dropped sharply to roughly 120 grams by the end of the period. Consumption is uncountable. The definite article is unnecessary here. Readers understand that consumption in the second sentence refers to the consumption of beef. So, when using an uncountable noun in a task 1 report, please think about whether you really need to use it with the definite article. Next up, let's talk about when to use the singular number and when to use the plural numbers. Let's look at this graph from L17 again. It shows the number of shops that closed and the number of new shops that opened. When describing this downward trend, we can say that the number of shops that opened decreased sharply from around 8,500 in 2011 to 4,000 in 2012. Here, it's best to use the singular number because the number of shops that opened is a variable that can take different values in different time frames. It's a single variable that changes over time. There's only one number for each year. However, if you describe these two lines at the same time, you should use the plural numbers because there are two different numbers for each year. For example, the numbers of shops that opened and the shops that closed were roughly 8,500 and 6,500 respectively in 2011. The numbers were 8,500 and 6,500 respectively in 2011. There are two numbers for 2011, that's why the plural numbers should be used. This version is grammatically correct, but it's written in a bad style. It's better to repeat the word number and say the number of shops that opened and the number that closed were roughly 8,500 and 6,500 respectively in 2011. This one is much more clear. So when there are two numbers for each year, you either use the plural numbers or use the word number twice. 
Hopefully, now you know when to use the singular number and when to use the plural numbers. The next common mistake I'm gonna talk about is still related to the definite article. Many English learners think superlative adjectives always take the definite article, like the highest, the lowest. Well, this is not true. Let's look at this graph. It shows the percentage of Australian men and women doing regular physical activity. For women, we can say that their participation was highest in the 45 to 54 age group. Here, we should use highest, not the highest. We use highest without the definite article when we are comparing something with itself in different circumstances. That is to say, we don't use the definite article when we are comparing the same thing. Here, we are not comparing women's participation to men's. We are comparing women's participation to women's participation. We are comparing women's participation in the 45 to 54 age group to women's participation in the other age groups. We are comparing the same thing, which is women's participation. That's why the definite article is not needed. Here's another example. This pie chart shows average percentages of sodium, saturated fats, and added sugars in typical meals consumed in the USA. The first chart represents sodium consumption. As you can see, sodium consumption is highest at dinner. Yes, we should use highest, not the highest, because we are comparing the same thing, which is sodium consumption. We are comparing sodium consumption at dinner to sodium consumption at other meals. So please keep in mind that superlative adjectives do not always take the definite article. Finally, let's talk about the most common mistake among students, which is paraphrasing at the expense of accuracy. I don't know who told you that you can't use the original wording. Well, this is definitely not true. Often the original wording is the best and doesn't have a close synonym. If you use different words, you will change the original meaning and end up losing marks. Take for example these charts. They show the proportions of British students at one university in England who were able to speak other languages in addition to English. When describing the category another language, many people change it to a foreign language or a second language. They think these students are British, so English is their mother tongue, and other languages are all foreign languages to them. But don't forget that many British people's parents are immigrants, so these people could be bilingual. Consider British people of Indian descent. English and Hindi could both be their mother tongues. They wouldn't call Hindi a foreign language, would they? So don't say the proportion of those who were able to speak a foreign language increased. Stick to the original wording and another language. Now let's look at these graphs. They show what UK graduate and postgraduate students who did not go into full-time work did after leaving college. Note that the charts used the verb "did," what they did after leaving college. Some did part-time work, some did voluntary work, and some did further study. You should really stick to the original verb "did" and not use verbs like "choose" or "opt." Don't say something like "Around thirty thousand graduates chose to do further study." How do you know they chose this path? Maybe their parents chose it for them. Perhaps their parents forced them to do further study. They might actually hate school. You should really just use "did." Around thirty thousand graduates did further study, or we can use "study" as a verb. Around thirty thousand graduates studied further. Changing the form of a word doesn't work every time, so don't be afraid of repeating the original wording. Don't be afraid of repeating individual words. It's unavoidable. To vary a language, try to use different grammatical constructions. For example, when writing your report, you may need to say two to three times that this category is the biggest. You may need to say it in the overview paragraph. Overall, the most common destination for graduate students was further study. You may also need to say it in details paragraphs. At nearly thirty thousand graduates who continued on to further studies, greatly outnumbered their counterparts who ended up in other situations. As you can see, 
Even though I didn't change the original wording in further study, the two sentences have different grammatical constructions. In the overview paragraph, I used most common destination to show that further study was the biggest category, and in the first details paragraph, I used all number to show that further study was the biggest category. This is how you should vary your language. Don't worry about repeating a few individual words. Instead, focus on using different grammatical constructions. I've covered a lot of information in this video. Let's recap what we've learned. One, use fluctuate, range, vary, hover, or essentially unchanged to describe trends accurately. This number fluctuated. This number varied or ranged between fifteen and twenty percent. This number hovered. This one was essentially unchanged. Two, in an actual exam, we won't have time to calculate a percentage increase. We are more likely to do simple calculations and use percentage points to show the difference between the two percentages. The proportion of those aged 15 to 59 is expected to increase by 11 percentage points to 57.3 percent. Three use the preposition of not among when comparing one member of a group to the rest. Washing machines were the most common of the three electrical appliances in 1920, with ownership reaching 40 percent of households. Washing machines are a member of the three appliances, so of is used. Four sometimes it's unnecessary to use the definite article with uncountable nouns. For example, we say forty percent of households owned a washing machine in 1920. Ownership then increased to seventy percent in 1960. We don't need to say the ownership. Five superlative adjectives don't always take the definite article. For example, we say that women's participation was the highest in the 45 to 54 age group, not the highest. Six use the singular number when the number you are reporting is a single variable that changes over time. For example, the number of shops that opened decreased sharply from around eight thousand five hundred in twenty eleven to four thousand in twenty twelve. However, when there are two different numbers or percentages for each year, the plural form should be used. The percentages of men and women in the youngest age group who did regular physical activity were 52.8 and 47.7 percent, respectively, in 2010. Finally, don't paraphrase at the expense of accuracy. For example, don't change another language to a foreign language. It's fine to use the original wording. That's all for this video. If you found this helpful, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.